morning, everybody, and welcome. Hi, Elizabeth, how are you? Hi, good, how are you? I am well, thank you. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you so much for having me. Excellent. Uh, welcome to everyone in the audience, and thank you for joining us today for another edition of uh, Building from Ground Up. My name is Tomiwa Aladikomo. I'm the CEO of Big Kabao Media, which is the parent company for Tech Kabao, uh, which organizes these events. Um, today, we have um, Elizabeth Tweedale with us. Hi, Elizabeth. Hello. Uh, Elizabeth is the founder and CEO of Cypher Coders, which is the UK's leading coding school for children. She's an experienced AI creator, author, and entrepreneur. And her mission is to empower children to move freely and confidently and fluently in the universal and very, very important language of code in order to become ready for the future. Um, at Cypher, they give children the chance to explore technology and dispel any myths about who can and who can't code. Um, Elizabeth from America, uh, where she got a degree in computer science and a master's in architecture, before working as a computational design specialist at several leading architectural offices, um, working on buildings like the Apple campus. How cool must that be? Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, prior to building Cypher, she co-founded an AI company called Ghostface, writing and patenting algorithms for its AI engine, dealing with the spatial adjacencies of people in the workplace and the future of sustainable <laughs> workspaces. And she's still on that. Yeah, that is a mouthful, but I'm very, very, I, I am super interested in this future of the workspace uh, conversation. So I think we will talk a little bit about that. Um, and I hope that some of the people who are joining us have some interesting ideas as well. I think even more than asking the audience to ask their questions today, I'd love to hear from any of the leaders in the audience or any of the people who are also thinking about how to motivate their teams, how it's working for them, this kind of word of, we're a world of hybrid workspaces, remote workspaces, and some people who are still maintaining like full, in-person in offices. So I'd like, I'd like to talk about that. Um, but anyway, um, Elizabeth written and co-written six books, prolific. Uh, the most recent, which is focused on teaching children Python. And she's passionate about unlocking code to the future for the next generation and creating a world where children can explore their unlimited appetite and curiosity by giving them the tools uh, to open doors and tackle whatever the future brings. So welcome, Elizabeth. Great to have you with us today. Thank you so much for the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, you've, you've done a lot that's worth introducing. Um, I should note, so the Building from Ground Up series is powered by the UK Nigeria Tech Hub. Uh, Tech Hub is the implementing partner for the series. Um, the Building from Ground Up series seeks to bring founders across Nigeria and the UK tech ecosystem together to share the stories of building and scaling their businesses as well as sort of useful and instructive insights for founders and aspiring founders. Last week on the fifth episode, we had Tito Ovia, who is the co-founder and the head of public sector growth for Helium Health. Um, the video for that session will be available soon on uh, the UK Nigeria Tech Hub's YouTube channel, but you can catch up on other episodes with founders like AutoCheck CEO, Itop Ikbe, Etop uh, Ikbe, MEC 3D's founder, Judith Okonkwo, and a favorite of ours. Um, and then the co-founders of MedSaf, Vivian Waka, and uh, Jao Pinheiro. Um, so you can check out all of those episodes on the UK Nigeria Tech Hub's UK uh, YouTube channel. Today's conversation will last about, uh, we'll have 45 minutes um, with me asking questions uh, that I've prepared. And then we'll have a Q&A of about 35 minutes where the audience gets to sort of ask questions. Um, and um, hopefully make it a bit interactive because I would like to hear a few people's thoughts on how they've been managing this. So um, when we get to that section, I might give a few people a chance to actually come on the mic and speak as well. Um, we're also gonna throw out a, a bunch of polls in the middle of the conversation, just to get a sense of, again, who the people in the audience are, how they're tackling some of these problems uh, that we're talking about or the issues that we're speaking about, et cetera. Um, so again, thank you everyone for joining us and uh, we're gonna jump right into this. Hey. So Elizabeth, we're going to start with just a bit of background about you, you know, so tell us a bit about Cypher Coders, what made you build it and sort of like how you how you came to that point, you know, I've talked a bit about your journey and what you did before, but I'd love to hear it from you. 
Yeah, sure, great. Um, well, thank you again for having me. Uh, you mentioned in uh, the, the bio about my background being in architecture. Um, and I think the, the lead up to Cypher Coders was really coming from what I was seeing in industry. So I was working as an architect, uh, designing buildings with code, which essentially means writing algorithms to define geometries or manage inventories or how things change um, throughout the, the design of the building process. It's always sort of this black box of architecture. Nobody knows what happens behind the scenes, but uh, it was quite a, a specialist group of um, computer scientists that were in this um, specialist modeling group. But what I saw was that a lot of my contemporaries, people that were practicing in architecture, were trying to teach themselves how to code. And they always were coming up against these sort of blocks because they were learning a specific language such as Python to do a very specific task. And because they had no foundation of why they chose that language particularly or how the language was built up, it was always quite frustrating. So I just kept seeing these people hit these barriers. And I'm also a mother of three. I actually now have a teenager in my household, which is uh, still shocking to me. Um, but I thought for my children, you know, this is something, uh, a base foundation of computer science or coding is something that all children and all people will need to know in order to be active members of society and to have the opportunities afforded to them to choose whatever career path they might like. So it's not to become, you know, definitely a, a whole world full of computer scientists, that's unrealistic. However, whatever you choose in the future will um, most likely involve technology. And so having a base understanding of how technology is built, how you know things on the internet are built um, is a really important thing for our education um, of our young people and of the next generation that was missing. So I founded Cypher uh, Coders off the back of that um, in order to uh, teach children how to code. So prepare that workforce of the future for what they will need to know um, to participate actively in their um, chosen field or chosen career. Uh, and the special thing about Cypher is that when I went to think about how do you teach children how to code, because, you know, Seymour Pap were taught coding with logo in the 70s. So it was, it's, it's been around a thing teaching kids how to code, you know, for, for many decades. However, it wasn't until the invention of Scratch, which is uh, a programming language using blocks that are sort of look like virtual Lego blocks you can stack together, um, which was developed by MIT that made it more readily available in this generation for children to learn how to code. So I came up with kind of a new idea of how we could teach children how to code, which uh, involves creative themes. And what that means is sort of um, learning with um, project-based learning, but things like architecture and coding being an obvious one from my background or conservation is really popular or fashion or things like that, but basically just a way to get more children interested in technology. And um, it seems to be working. 52% of our students are girls, which is um, you know, a huge uh, passion of mine, getting more females in, into tech and into STEM. But I think by just showing that you have 52% girls, it shows that there's a broader range of children. So even those boys on the other side, aren't just that very stereotypical sort of gamer, geeky boys, which I can say because that was me as a, as a child, just, just not the boy part, <laughs> but the gamer part. Uh, so yeah, I guess that's a, a bit of a lead into to Cypher and um, my passion behind it and why it came about. That's very cool. Um, and definitely something interesting for those of us who have recently become girl dads. <laughs> um, so talk to me about the early stages of starting the business. Um, how did that, you know, so once you made the decision to, to do it, what did that look like? What did just getting it off the ground um, look like? What were the big challenges? What were the big successes? Um, yeah, you know, did you come into this with, you know, a stash of cash and ability to do it for 18 months? Or, you know, like, how did you, how did you build it out just for early stages? Um, that's a, a great question. I wish I came up into it with a stack of cash. Right <laughs> <You> didn't? <laughs> <laughs> but I think um, it, it sort of comes from before that. I think I've always been a serial entrepreneur. Uh, okay. And what that actually means is really just giving it a go. So, you know, there's a lot of 
businesses that I've started, which weren't actually businesses, but more like a passion project, such as, um, you know, selling makeup or <laughs> creating bracelets and selling those kinds of things or organizing children's parties. And I think that kind of mentality of just giving something a go and seeing what sticks is the most important precursor to starting a business. So when it came to Cypher, as we just discussed, I saw this problem in the industry. I was a mom and I was like, well, let's just give it a go and teach some kids. So I started with six kids and taught them lessons and was writing the lesson plans every week and seeing how they reacted and then started to build it off the back of that. So I always had this drive to build something, a business, but you know, that could have been an architecture practice or, you know, a, a, an events planning company for children's parties or, you know, anything that came out of my passions. And it was really just this specific need of seeing that this was a huge issue for the world and for us as a society but really it was a personal thing saying this is what my children need to know so I'm going to do it small and then you start saying how do we build it up from there so with Cypher yeah it just started started small and then had communications or you know connections off the back of one first class and then to the next class I think the most important thing about Cypher's um over 50% of our students come recommended by a friend. So when you talk about, you know, customer acquisition and that kind of thing, that really promotes the, the network effect because, you know, and, oh, and the viral coefficient the because they're all referring each other. And it, it kind of comes back to, to product market fit as well. Um, if you have one class and all the kids love your class, they also come with their friends. They're gonna keep coming back to the next class and then they're gonna bring more friends. And actually that's just how it sort of grows. So I think focusing on the product first was one of my um, biggest- Smart decisions, yeah. yeah. yeah focuses and, and decisions. There's something you said in there that's really interesting, which is, you know, this is, this is your serial entrepreneur. And I think that's a thing that, um, uh, and I think you said something else, which is you've always had a desire to build something. And it's something that you see quite a bit with entrepreneurs. Um, and I mean, even for me, you know, my current business is not the first business I've attempted to run or attempted to build. <laughs> and I think it's an interesting, it's an interesting impulse. I guess for the question I want to ask you is, what do you know now? What did you learn from your previous, you know, um, efforts building businesses and the other work that you've done that's come to play in here or that's been valuable in building this business? Um, what's different this time than when you, you know? Yeah, um, right. yeah. yeah. Um, that's a great question. I think that the learnings that I've taken from other businesses, so for example, uh, my husband and I did run an architecture practice for a while, uh, was about, you know, you, you sort of take little learnings away from each thing. I mean, I remember hiring my first employee and it seems like this big task and you're like, okay, now I need an employment contract and, you know, I need to, you know, be really official about this and what are the holiday days and what, are the, you know, what is a pension and all of these things that, you know, nobody's going to be trained in all of the things that you experience as an entrepreneur, but it's that kind of excitement of finding little problems along the way. Like how do you hire your first employee? How do you deal with your first employee going on maternity leave? You know, all of these things are little challenges that um, you face every day. So I think it's not really one thing that you learn from previous businesses that you take into the next ones, but it's uh, amassing just the doing over and over and over again um, that you can bring to light. But from your question, the main th takeaway and the main difference um, for Cypher is comes and my team will laugh, but it always comes back to, to automating things. So I'm obsessed with automation, which I think goes hand in hand with technology. But the interesting thing about automation is you can't automate something just out of the blue. I mean, you can, but it's not as, success, as successful. So with Cypher, we have this kind of mentality of just give it a go, uh, you know, hire your first 30 teachers and, you know, see what the, the most difficult part in that process is and then try to streamline that piece uh, and then streamline the next piece. So it's all about creating more efficiencies as you scale your business and as you grow your business and just taking time to reflect on what is taking my time or what is the most painful 
piece of my, you know, my 40 hour work week. None of us as entrepreneurs only work for 40 hours, but you know, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, my, my COO actually did this amazing um, activity with me. So she actually uh, previously ran the NatWest Business Accelerator. So she was actually coaching um, over 300 entrepreneurs. I was one of her coachees. So she was coaching me and uh, before I, I stole her away for Cypher. Um, but she sat me down and she said, okay, Elizabeth, let's look at your diary uh, and literally write against it how much time you spend on emails, how much time you spend designing flyers for the camps, how much time you'd spend preparing lesson plans. And then we kind of grouped those all together. And that was actually such an important piece because I found actually I'm spending like 20 hours a week on graphic design. So maybe the next person I should hire should be a graphic designer and then I'll have half of my time back. Um, so just that kind of understanding of what you're spending time on, what, you're, um, what could, you could be doing more efficiently and effectively is one of those learnings that as you keep doing it over and over and over again, you bring to your next experience and just make it better every time. Fantastic. I'm gonna, I wanna actually take us back a little bit and I want to ask about the size of uh, Cypher Coders today as a business, you know, mm -hmm. so how many people are on your team? How many people are you serving? Uh, you know, you started out with sort of five students, but where are you as a business today? Yeah, so uh, this past year, we've taught um, around 3,600 students um, okay. in 21 countries or, or more um, the last time we checked. So uh, that, that's really exciting. Uh, my team is about... 12 um, on our kind of core cypher team and then we have over 65 teachers uh, so yeah that's kind of where well, we are well, 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 that, that is some growth you know from five yeah. students and yourself um okay so i'm still interested in the early days of the business and what were the first really big challenges so you've got five students you know you're starting to see what's working what was the first thing that was like, mm, maybe this is not the business for her. Like, maybe this is not a business. Maybe I should be doing something else. What was like the hardest thing that first hit you? Um, I think one of the hardest things right at the beginning of starting any business, and particularly with Cypher, is cash flow. Um, you know, it's one of those businesses, and I'm lucky, is that people have been paying for my product from day one because, you know, the, parent, the parents pay for the courses. So... You know, I don't have some of the same hurdles that, you know, other tech companies might have where you have to develop stuff first before you get any paying clients. You might have to have a lot of free clients first. So it's a, it's a different, I was quite lucky in that. But still, in order to grow, you know, you need cash because you can kind of build up the number of students and classes you are making and say, okay, actually, now I can afford to hire another person, which will mean we can service this many more students or, you know, onboard this many more schools. Um, and grow organically, but I've grown businesses organically in the past and it's just slow. So my first biggest hurdle was probably deciding that I was going to raise investment and therefore putting all of the, the pieces into place behind that to show that this is a business model. You know, it's not just me sitting in, you know, <laughs> a yeah, classroom. It's, it's, it's not a lifestyle kids. business. It's not a hobby. Ex exactly. Like this is going to grow to a size that makes it worth an investor coming on board. Exactly. Exactly. So then saying, okay, I need to do the financial model, you know, Googling like, what is a financial model? I mean, I love a spreadsheet, but you know, if you've never gone to business school, you've got to, got to work it out. Yeah. Um, that was an exciting challenge, but yeah, I guess just preparing for uh, that initial stage of investment, knowing that I had this passion to take it more beyond a, a lifestyle business, as you said. Um, yeah. I mean, and that's an interesting decision, you know, uh, and it's a critical one for founders because it determines the direction of your business. Uh, you can build a lot of wonderful things by bootstrapping. And absolutely. I think, and I absolutely salute the resilience and the capacities of people who are able to bootstrap a business. But then sometimes, like you said, you know it's going to be so much slower if you do that. <laughs> and you have to decide, I mean, is there an opportunity to build something really big and really impactful if I go out and take cash? Yeah. Um, but I think what's critical for people, and this is an important lesson that, I, that I'll just sort of uh, bang on, you do have to know that you're going to build something that's actually sizable for you to go out and take that um, 
risk of raising capital because then the people that give you money are going to have expectations, you know. Yeah. Um, and that's not a question, but that's just uh, something that I'm emphasizing for the people in the audience. Um, so that's a hard problem is you are pulling together a business plan when you've never done it before, you are putting together financial models, you are solving a particularly big challenge. And I, I remember actually even in this business that I run, that was one of the early challenges was sort of like putting together a pitch deck for the first time um, and working through it and working through the model and all of that. How do you convey to your team the grit to work through problems like that? You know, when you build a team, as a, as a founder and a serial entrepreneur, there's a certain amount of like, get it done that you sort of build internally. If I, and if you're ever gonna succeed at anything, you have to build it. Yeah. But for employees who don't come into the team who haven't had the same experiences as you, they don't necessarily come in with sort of that need or understanding or drive and they don't own the business. So, you know, like it's, it's <laughs> pay me every month and you know, like yeah. hallelujah. So how do you communicate that need to like solve hard problems, to grind through things to your team? Well, I, I mean, I think it's a person by person thing. I think you could probably fit into two different camps. I fit into the camp of, you know, just lead by example. But I also yeah. say I'm probably one of those more, more of like a, a renaissance woman like i'm a jack of all trades but I, i'm not necessarily an expert in any of them yeah and so you know but you have other founders that are like super you know intelligent and really i have an expertise in one thing but kind of nothing you know on the other side but for me because i knew that i could take take our um, graphic designer as an example because she is one of our first hires i knew that i could put together a flyer um and show her how to do it and essentially understand the process and know how long that should take and these kinds of things that when she went to do it um she would be empowered to do it one step better than i could and so i think it was almost like motivating her for her own personal development and her own personal skills um but again having that foundation that she knew i understood her challenges or Photoshop crashing or, you know, like just the, the little, the little things. Um, but if you don't have that, it's more just um, the communication uh, and making sure that that's really important with your team. Because uh, I did ask my team, you know, what are the, what are the things that motivated you or that still motivate you? And one person um, who's our, our marketing manager, who actually just joined us a couple of weeks ago, she said that she really feels appreciated um, and also the communication with our, uh, within our company is very efficient, all about efficiencies, <laughs> but she said, um, that that really motivates her, which I thought was, it was an interesting thing because I can see that from, you know, from all of the employees that I've had over the years is that it's, it's that making it personal and showing that you appreciate their work, but also having that two-way communication. So it's not just, you know a top-down dictatorship thing like this one needs to be done you know get it done by x amount of time it's is this you know this is what needs to be done is it feasible is that a realistic time scale let's talk about it um to to communicate that and i think that works really well so i like that i mean a few things i do um that are probably worth pulling out there um i like the just asking the team what motivates you i think that's really interesting um and i think leader as leaders sometimes you don't do that asking explicitly because it then gives you the opportunity to say well yeah and i like to make it personal so you do have to sort of like know what makes this person tick is not going to be the same thing that makes that person tick yeah. i think what's interesting and i maybe want to double tap on or dig in a little bit deeper on is so you can show a person how to do a task like how to design a flyer um, and I like from a motivational perspective, sort of asking the questions and thinking about how you motivate people, but how do you communicate values across the business and across the team so that when you hire somebody new, everybody's coming in and they know this is what matters to us at Cypher Coders. This yeah. is the kind of employee or the kind of business that we're trying to build. Like what are your mechanisms for communicating that and making sure everybody is on the same page? Yeah, yeah. Um, that, that's a great question. I mean, I think it comes down to just the, the personal nature of having a, a proper communication like, like a human <laughs> instead of like the robotic 
you know, regular answers. So I'm the worst interviewer. My team laughs at me every time because I don't ask any of the interview questions. You know, we, mm -hmm. I, I want to find out what kind of person people are and, and what motivates them. Um, but I think the main uh, important thing for me when hiring people is seeing that they have an internal drive and that they want to, you know, make something of themselves. It doesn't matter what that is and that we can help them on that journey. And it kind of goes hand in hand with Cypher preparing children for the future. We also wanna prepare all of our staff for the future. Hopefully that's still a Cypher, but maybe it's not. Um, you know, we had someone uh, that was with us for a couple of years and she just uh, moved on to a new position, but she started out in one role um, within the job in, in marketing. Then she moved to customer success. Then she was in like, you know, data and all, you know, obsessed with like analytics and these kinds of things. Um, and so it was that prog career progression uh, that was really important to her. Uh, so I think it, it comes back to just seeing somebody that's passionate for life uh, and wanting to, to drive that forward. The other thing is, you know, as a founder, you built this business because you had a passion for something. And yeah. so I always find it, I found it fascinating. We did this um, visioning workshop. And so I would, we had a lot of um, parents uh, and moms working for the business in the early days made a lot of sense right we teach kids how to code they have kids you know makes sense um but as the company grows you know we have more younger people that don't necessarily have families but we had a visioning workshop and said well, what what motivates you about cypher but they all have very they're super passionate about what we do for one reason or another that are aligned but not necessarily the same so some of them are about the impact that we're, we're, we're making. And some of them are about um, the, the growth of the company and how it's exciting that, you know, independent of what we do, we're, we're at this stage and we're going to that stage and that's what excites them. But it's aligning the vision and that passion for the actual product, the actual company um, that I think is really important when hiring. So if somebody comes to me and they're like, I love Cypher because of this, this, and this, and this is why it relates to me. And my grandmother taught me how to code. and you know, you know, these kinds of things, it just shows that spark of interest that aligns then with the vision of the company and the values um, uh, of the of the team, really. I like that. I think that's, yeah, that's um, really interesting. My next question was actually going to be about what you look for uh, when you're hiring employees, or I think you've actually just pretty much uh, <laughs> outlined that. So find people who are passionate about the same sort of business that you are that you are doing and will share sort of some of the drive to actually bring this thing to life. And I think that's a really important, um, that's a really important thing uh, to find. Um, are there any other special things you look out for in those on Autodox interviews of yours or? Well, not in the interviews, but um, going circling back to the, the motivation of the staff. Yeah. Um, we've done a few kind of uh, things which I found fascinating. So, um, I don't know if you've heard of those those quizzes like the love languages. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sounds really cheesy, but we <laughs> but we did this as as a team, and it was actually really useful because uh, it, it it basically breaks down into you know do people value uh, you giving them more time or do they value you know obviously the, the obvious one of the love languages like a hug or words of affirmation. But we did this quiz uh, as a team, and it was really interesting uh, to see how people would like to receive praise. So, do I mean I'm a gift giver, right? So during COVID, when you know it was really hard, we sent everybody you know chocolates or flowers or things like that. Which for me, I'm like, okay, yes, top on the back. I've done a really nice thing for my team. But then when you actually drill down to it, some of them actually just like to be told you've done a really good job today. And that's worth 10 times as much to them as like a box of chocolates. So that was one little, I don't know, hack that we have to, to figure out, you know, what makes your employees tick, which I loved. And the second thing is um, doing a personality test. So we just did this, <laughs> you know, such as like the Myers-Briggs personality test or the, the 16 personalities. Um, we just did this at a team away day, but it was fascinating because it helped us to hone our communications within each other with to the team. Uh, and it, it was a sort of an aha moment because it's one of those things that brings out who are the extroverts and the introverts. You would think that this was like an, an obvious, um, you know, 
saying after spending time with your colleagues, but those surprising things of how, again, how people communicate, what type of personality they are and who actually fits into the same categories was really helpful to understand how the team dynamic could work better or where we might potentially need to find more people to hire when we come to hiring our next person. So potentially like in the lower right hand uh, yellow box, <laughs> for, for example. <laughs> <laughs> we need um, more of this and less of that, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we need more feelers, less analytics, you know, we need more <laughs> this kind of thing, so. <laughs> Quite interesting, huh? Yeah, so that, that kind of comes to the hiring. I don't know if I would give somebody a personality test before hiring them, but. So maybe, yeah, maybe. so that stuff that's happening in sort of team exercises and sort of like retreats, et cetera, as yeah. a way to understand the team better. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Um, so um, let's jump right into the core of this conversation in terms of sort of remote teams. Um, and um, what was your structure as a team before 2020? So going into COVID, you know, how did you work as a team? Yeah, so we, um, our core team worked in an office, uh, which is really, you know, great. Uh, but then all of our teachers are contractors. So we wouldn't really see them um, on a, on a day to day basis. So we would have to sort of schedule team events with the teachers in order to kind of facilitate that, you know, group dynamic or the, the passion that we have for Cypher and, and training, you know, exercises and things like that. So before COVID, we were in an office um, and our teachers were kind of distributed throughout London, but we would have kind of team events every so often. And then obviously with um, the pandemic, the onset of the pandemic, everyone was stuck at home. But that was a, a really interesting point for us because we decided we were going to go fully remote. You know, there were some of those um, discussions it, should we get an office space again? Should we come in one day a week, two days a week, this kinds of thing. But actually when we um, just did our most recent funding round and we were um, making some key hires, there are a lot of amazing people that aren't exactly where <laughs> would be feasibly close enough to come to an office. So okay. just by making that decision that will be fully remote meant that we had the whole world to hire from. I mean, okay, maybe not maybe not the whole world right away, but even if you <laughs> spread out to all of the UK or, um, you know, so that you're at least in the same jurisdiction of, of some sort, but uh, we had some amazing hires that, you know, wouldn't be able to come to the office every day. So it was a big decision, but we, we jumped in and Fantastic. so far it's going okay. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but I'm actually going to, we're going to launch a second poll for the people in the audience. And the question is, what percentage of you are um, running teams that have gone full remote or are hybrid, um, you know, like based on the pandemic, um, which of you are still full in the office, basically? And if you have switched to full remote or partially remote, how's that going? So the poll is live right now. We'd love as many answers as possible. So if you want to just click through it and let's get a sense of how, uh, what people's experiences have been. Um, I guess, what would you say have been the advantages and disadvantages of going full remote? Maybe we start with the disadvantages. Actually, no, let's do it in whatever order you prefer. So what, what's worked about it and then what hasn't worked? Um, well, on the, on the advantages, I mean, the first one be, being the obvious that I just spoke about is that when we're scaling and hiring, yeah. Yeah. You, can, you can go from anywhere, um, yeah. which is great. And I think that that's where, you know, the world is, is going with, you know, the future of work and things. But coming to the, the disadvantages is the value that you get out of being together in a room with real people yeah. is really difficult to pinpoint, right? And um, again, coming back to my employees and asking them what has motivated them, a lot of them said those team days that we have together or when we were in the office and we all did yoga together on Thursdays. So that's, I think, the challenge that we have with fully remote working is how do you maintain that togetherness when you can't actually physically get together all of the time. Now um, at Cypher, about a quarter of our staff are based in the US because we're sort of scaling there. Um, and then three quarters are here in the UK. So. As, as an example, at our Christmas party, all of our UK employees came together for a Christmas party, even though they were, you know, coming from left, right, and center. 
uh, it was still, you know, feasible for them to come. But our US colleagues, you know, had to join us still on Zoom and we sent them like a care package to, to, to sort of be celebrating together. Not quite the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's just not. It's just not. So I think that's a, a real disadvantage that, um, you know, we'll have to work out. And so I think what will happen is, you know, right now it's kind of all over the place, higher from anywhere. There might be somebody in, <laughs> you know, Ecuador, somebody else in, in Canada and somebody in, you know, America, and then, you know, on, on this side of the, the pond and all of the continents, but it'll probably be more like fully remote, but then trying to set up little hubs with your teams. So that for me feels like a, a nice strategy for hiring, even though you could hire from anywhere, trying to focus potentially on, you know, hiring everyone that from Sheffield or someplace in the north, it, it, you know, might afford certain advantages that even a smaller subset of your team could get together in real life, um, which I think a lot of people find value from. But yeah. for us, um, trying to have the, the per, trying to bring the real life personal experience into the virtual yeah. is what we we do um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So we have daily standups uh, with all of, within all of our teams. So you're always seeing your teammates um, every single day. We have weekly kickoffs every Monday where we go through all of our tasks and things like that. But I think um, a couple of people on my team also mentioned that those daily standups are so important because you just see another human face-to-face. -face. And yes, of course, you're working with them behind the scenes on Discord and messaging and things are flying around and in the virtual, but seeing people face to face is really important. And we made a very conscious decision right at the beginning that every time we come to meetings, everyone has their camera on, which I think not a lot of teams do that in, in this day and age. So you can see very quickly who's like not paying attention and start doing something else or like going to make a cup of tea, which is fine, but that's how it is in, in like a real office too. So, yeah. um, you know, I think that was an important decision that we made and I think it helps bring the team together in more of a real virtual way. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Could you tell us a little bit more about the daily standups? Like how long does it last? What's the format? Um, that's a thing that people would be, I think a lot of people would like to know a bit more about. Yeah, so I think um, coming from, um, you know, the tech world, but our chief product officer, you know, having run uh, tech teams as well, we, it's kind of operate on a, a sprint basis and using kind of that scrum style. So every Monday, um, First of all, we've broken the, the company up into different teams and we have OKRs, which are objectives and key results. So every quarter we set these um, basically like three main objectives and then you have certain key results against each one that you can track. Um, and then within the teams, um, every Monday, there's a 45 minute meeting where you sit down and you, and you actually talk through what are we doing to kind of push that key result or push this objective forward. We need to change any of the tasks or any, or any problems. So that's a bit of a longer meeting. And then every day, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you just have a 15 minute, what we call stand up. Um, so, you know, in, in the tech world and things, um, when I used to have a, an actual tech team and I was a CTO, you actually stand up and then everybody goes around and says what they're doing. <laughs> it's a, it's a, yeah. very, um, so we aren't actually standing up on, on zoom. We're just going on, <laughs> on zoom, and, yeah. but it's just a 15 minute meeting every day, same time of a day, uh, with your team. So some, there's obviously overlaps within the team. You know, we have a product team, an online team an operations team, teachers team. Um, so you might be in two teams and see sort of two different sets of people, but it's a really nice way to just check in and also see your team in real life virtually. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, and how many people are in a team, might be on a team? Yeah, so um, minimum three, obviously, otherwise it's not really a team, um, but most of the teams are around five or six. Gotcha, okay, so about three, between three and six people in a team. Okay, and that's a good size for a standup. I mean, like at what time, at what size does it become too many people for a standup to be efficient? Because I can imagine if 12 people are going through what it is they're doing on a daily basis, 15 minutes doesn't seem very, yeah. like very long for that to happen. Yeah, I think anywhere, even at six is, is pushing it because then it just becomes more like a, a small company meeting, right? And you have one person leading and just saying, you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this. You can't actually have the conversations in 15 
15 minutes. Yeah. So yeah, I'd say stick to five people max on smaller teams. Um, and then it feels more personal and people can actually be heard. We've also um, previously trialed, you know, who's running the standup. So if you have a list of tasks, the standup um, in the standup, you go through the list of tasks and ask people um, how they're getting on. Yes, I've done that. No, I haven't done that. It's very um, fast and straightforward. But one week, um, person A would actually lead the standups and be the person that says, okay, how's it going? You know, share their screen sort of thing. The next week might be somebody else because then at the company meeting the following Monday, they report back on what's been done the previous week. Okay. Um, but I think the nice thing about that is that it also gives um, junior members of the, the team a chance to step up and be a leader, but they've also been shown how to do it because it's just a very standard thing once the, you know, your kind of team lead does it and then it's yeah. your turn. It, it gives them a good opportunity to present and to, you know, and step so you up. To build up some leadership yeah. skills as well, just in terms of like, kind of like, um, yeah, l learn how to, you know, run something like that. It's quite mm -hmm. interesting. Let me ask um, a big problem with working remote, uh, and we found this in 2020, and a lot of people have found it um, even since then, is that burnout seems to happen a little bit more frequently. And I, um, I mean, there's any number of reasons for that, but what's been your experience with that? You know, how are you avoiding it and uh, sort of how are you tackling it? Yeah. If um, you've had to, you know, Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what founder hasn't had burnout, <laughs> but um, I think in the very beginning of COVID was when, you know, a lot of teams really struggled with this and, and our team definitely, but it was this sense that you always had to be switched on. And so I think that that little message notification from Slack or Discord starts to like really like make people twitch because it just, just keeps coming. Um, so one of the, <laughs> that made our team. It's actually, yeah, so that freaks out everybody who joins our team is like, just like there's so much mess, we wear Slack and they're like, yeah. there's so many messages. And I'm like, <laughs> I have Slack permanently muted. I only go in. Yeah, yeah. Like, but even that, I don't think like works for everyone, you know, it's, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't. <laughs> uh, so that was one of the, the biggest challenges is that it's, it's an assumption that everybody has to be turned on all of the time. And yeah. so just putting in little um, things that can help with that or an understanding that after six o'clock, especially now that we have people in different time zones on the other side of the Atlantic, um, it, there's an expectation that after six o'clock, for example, you don't expect a, a reply. Obviously people do, do still reply and my team's amazing. It's like they never switch off, even though we tell them to. But we also um, encourage people to do exactly what you just said, mute the channels. But if somebody actually needs you, then they at you. So you only get a notification yeah. if it's specifically we need an in, you know, impact, you know, we need something from you in order to um, get on with this decision. But the, the constant messaging is definitely the biggest challenge for, for burnout being a, a remote team. But again, it just comes back to, I think, checking in with your team every so often. How's it going? And then setting new rules. It's sort of the same um, sorts of advice that I, I oftentimes give to parents around screen time with their children. Uh, there's no one answer at, because teams change, teams evolve, and the way that we work changes. So it's more of check in every quarter or you know every six months and say what's working for you, what's not working for me for you, what can we put in place, what can we change to make it better, and even if you think you have it perfect, then by another three months or six months, it's, it's going to be terrible again, right? Like we're, it's constantly moving and technology is constantly moving and we're you know evolving as humans every day. Yeah. What would you say? I mean. Um... For anyone moving their team from a physical team to a full remote team, are there any big things that you would say, or big lessons you would say they should definitely pay attention to? I think one of the advantages of being in an office is you can read people's personal body languages and you know how they're feeling that day and that kind of thing uh, seems really obvious. Uh, but that's much more difficult on, on a screen. So having to communicate things out loud that you naturally in person wouldn't have to do, you would just say, oh, she looks like she's having a bad day. We're just gonna 
you know, talk to her after lunch or something like that. But you can't, yeah. those kind of feelings and things don't come across the screen very well. So just remembering to check in with your team just on a message or with individuals, if you see, you know, that they might be struggling, those kinds of things uh, on a regular basis is important. Again, it comes right back to my, my number one advice is that if you can set a rule that everyone goes on camera at a certain time, I think it's really important. I mean, I don't care if you're in your pajamas or you haven't showered in a week and your hair is sticking out to one side, just seeing you on camera is so important because it just shows that you're there. So, you know, I think that's what it been, would be my number one advice if you're moving your team to remote. Um, I mean, you can even go further. <laughs> There's some software tools that some like so software developers oftentimes use where it actually takes a picture of your um from your camera every like 30 oh, seconds wow. yeah. and so it almost like, yeah. shows, like that's too far for me i think it's hilarious think, yeah that, that feels a little bit creepy <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but you know if you even just have the 15 minute stand up you know sometimes we have people joining from and they're like on a train or like they're on the tube and you're like where are you going <laughs> But it's fine. At least you know. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas if they just <laughs> join with their virtual picture and muted, you're like, "Are you actually there?" <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me ask you a question. I mean, like, do you do you get any pushback against stand-ups? You know, or do people feel you know report any anxiety from it? Like, or or is it just it's the way we work and everybody's fine? You know. Yeah. It. I actually have you know so the team when I ask them what motivates them almost all of them said the daily standups. So I think it's the, also the expectation that you don't have to come to the daily standups. So if, for example, a meeting is scheduled over the standup, you would prioritize the meeting, but okay. you would just message okay. the team beforehand and say, sorry, I'm not coming today because I have a meeting or you know, my internet went out or these kinds of things, but they actually have to communicate why they're not coming. But they, they actually really like it because it is that thing that makes it personal and brings um that that personal element to a virtual team we also uh in our company meetings on on mondays have the first 15 minutes is a, a coffee chat so i just put the team into random breakout rooms and we just have 15 minutes to talk because it's one of those things that you know is the best part of being in an office is that sort of uh, you know, when you go to make a cup of tea or get a coffee and you're just standing by the coffee maker and having like a two minute chat, like, oh, what did you do this weekend that we we lose out on and that we miss um, by being a virtual team. So it feels really awkward at first sort of scheduling those like impromptu chats into your day, but then it becomes more natural. And it is that thing that I think as humans, we really need for our connection to others and having a connected team that actually cares about each other is going to yeah. be a, a more effective team, a more efficient team, and you know, just better all around for their own personal psyches as well. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so I, we're gonna jump into questions from the audience in a moment. So if you have any questions for Elizabeth, could you please put them in, your, uh, in the Q&A section, please? I'm just going to look at this poll and just kind of like talk about um, what it is that we're seeing. And I don't know if you can see it, Elizabeth. Yeah. It looks like so about 56 people answered. We've got just under 100 people on this call. So um, just uh, over half of them sort of uh, responded. So about 30%, 29% of those switched to full remote. 34% are partially remote, 29% were remote and have now returned to the office and 9% uh, remote work is not for them at all. So it looks like the vast majority of people are still spending at least some time in the office um, and haven't gone full remote, which isn't too surprising to me, especially given this is a mostly Nigerian audience here today. Um, if you have switched to full or partially remote, how's that going? So far about 46% of people say they're loving it. They're selling the office building and um, about 21% the question just doesn't answer to them. 30% of them think nothing really beats time in the office. Interesting mix of answers. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, have you spoken to other team leads? Have you spoken to other like business owners and leaders? What kind of like things have you heard from them about this? Well, the, the interesting thing is um, 
you know, I think you mentioned at the, the beginning of the call that I previously uh, co-founded an artificial intelligence company called GoSpace um, yeah. about getting people together in the workplace. So um, the whole point of that company is making sure teams are in the right place at the right time in corporate real estate. So before COVID, believe it or not, you know, big companies, you know, like banks and big tech companies and things like that, were looking at how to make their teams more efficient, but also optimize their real estate. Well, after COVID, I mean, this is clearly a thing. So what GoSpace does is actually works out who should be in the office on which days and how to get the teams together so that you have an, a dedicated space in the office for the days when your team should be together. So take those like groups that you have on Slack, turning the, the virtual into the physical. So in, in real life, so getting the right teams together on the right day. So you would know that I need to come in on Tuesday and Thursday because that's when my team's coming in. And when I do go in, there's going to be a place for me in the office space. So that was a, a long-winded answer to your question, but yes, we're seeing this trend um, everywhere, right up to you know big big businesses that you would think would be the last people to allow kind of a hybrid working style. But it's what people, because we were all forced into it in the pandemic, there are definitely you know advantages and disadvantages from working from home. I mean, I have to deal with like you know toys on the floor over there. <laughs> I mean, like talk about like focusing on on work, um, but it's definitely a, a trend that we we can't ignore. The office is is there to stay, but also the virtual. So I think the hybrid is probably the most likely. But then it comes back to again what we spoke about hiring remote teams. So how do you work with that hybrid um, model and uh, allow people to come into the office? At, or work from home, but that's where kind of the, the service office approach is, is picking up steam. And so even though you, you might have somebody in North Carolina, um, yeah. you might go to <laughs> an office space in North Carolina um, two days a week because it's that act of going to the office that I think, you know, empowers a lot of people and, and brings a lot of people comfort and a, a sense of purpose than staying in your house all the time <laughs> not yeah. having a place to go <laughs> yeah. no I do find I, I find this because I work from home a, a fair bit I'm doing this call from my house um, yeah. <laughs> but I I do find even the, the the transit changes the way your brain works you know that state change kind of jogs you makes you think about different things and then yeah. you get in there and there's people to knock ideas off of and it's amazing how much denser the communication, how many more ideas you can communicate within a five minute conversation with someone than even over a call like this. And I mean, you can have a pretty good conversation, but it's still just not as information rich as, you know, yeah. sitting on the table with somebody. Yeah, I think, I think we're getting better as, at it, you know, as a, a human race, I guess, um, than we were, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, but it's, it's absolutely true what you said. You, you can't replace that human interaction. Um, you know, even just raising investment virtually versus, you know, in person. I'd say I have to have three times as many meetings in the virtual with a potential investor than I would face to face because face to face, you know, you you read the body language. It's the same things that we're talking about with, um, you know, reading your team. Uh, and seeing how they're feeling and getting that personal thing across through the, the virtual world um, in the meta, really. Um, uh, so it, it's definitely something to consider when you're when you're hiring and when you're thinking about being fully remote or uh, a hybrid work environment. Okay, all right, cool. Um, so we're gonna jump into the Q and A. Uh, there's actually one set of questions that I still have for you. But the very first question um, kind of jumps into something related. So it's from someone named Hepsiba. Um, and Hepsiba, I apologize if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, Abigail. And so um, she's saying, so nice to connect to you here. She's a mobile software developer in training. And she wants to ask the languages you learned and how to cope with the rugged aspects of it. I mean, I guess that's the more difficult aspects of learning a language. Um, so yeah, what are your thoughts about she thinks your name is esther it's elizabeth not esther <laughs> um, <laughs> That's okay. yes. all right um 
Well, in terms of coding languages, uh, which is, I'm sure what she's talking about, yeah. my, um, my original language was C++. Yes, that really dates my education. <laughs> Very few people code in that now. Uh, I mean, on this side of the pond- You don't look it, they won't know. <laughs> predominantly taught is, as Java, uh, but Java and you know, C++ are kind of lower level languages. But with Cypher, uh, and something that we're really passionate about with the kids is that we don't teach one specific language. We transition them between different languages so that they don't get stuck in those kind of the syntax of one thing and not be able to move to the next. So I think when you're choosing a language, uh, it's important to understand why you're choosing it or what it's for. For example, you know, if you're creating a website, you're using HTML, um, CSS to style it. And if you want things to happen, you're using JavaScript. Theoretically, you can put Python behind, uh, you know, a web page to to do some you know, tables or things like that, or some uh, tricks behind the scenes. But it would be kind of unnatural. Whereas Python might be used um, for uh, behind app development or when creating AI or these kinds of things uh, might be a better language. So if you had to pick just one language. Uh, that's tricky. It's prob probably most useful, most widely used would be JavaScript, um, but Python's also great. But the main thing that I would say is that the best coders don't actually, you know, as a coder, you're not sitting in a black room, with like, you know, a black screen and, and green text going across it like the matrix. I mean, <laughs> that's not real life. The best coders are actually just really good Googlers. So, um, I like you that. I like that. You shouldn't really, you shouldn't really be <laughs> so worried about this. Google. <laughs> Google. As, as much as, you know, if you know kind of what you want your code to do, you Google it, you find somebody else's piece of code, you put that in and then you, you fix it. Um, but just looking at other code will already show you, okay, this type of code needs a semicolon at the end. This one needs a, a curly bracket holding it in, you know, on the, holding the object in place or that one should have been, um, you know, I need a colon here, that kind of thing. So just com comparing other code with whatever you're trying to make in your code is the easiest way for me to debug my own code. Uh, but yeah, just be a good Googler. <laughs> yeah. Okay. There are a ton of really interesting team questions coming up in the Q&A, but I'm going to ask one more question around coding and skills. I think we talked about that yesterday um, in our kind of like, uh, build up. So a lot of the work that you do, so I want to ask this coding question before we get into like all the team stuff. And so a lot of the work you do is around sort of like helping people build up, you know, their coding skills and sort of thinking around and helping people change the sense of what a coder looks like in the future. And so, I mean, a bit related to that question that we've just asked is what are the key messages that you have around this in terms of how people build themselves up to be coders, you know, how people think about tech skills and tech roles kind of more broadly. Um, so what needs to change around the way we think about those? Yeah. So I think the main thing and the main message that I kind of keep trying to, to, to push out to the world is that we need to redefine who coders are. So again, coming back to like our perception of, you know, the matrix people, like <laughs> typing out the code, that's not actually the, the real world. Yes, of course, there's people that are super coders, uh, but actually code is in all careers. So understanding that different um, types of people are different types of coders. So even within the coding and the tech industry, you have certain people that write algorithms or that do very um, hyper specific, uh, you know, complex algorithms, but they might not necessarily be the ones that even code those algorithms and program them, or even the ones that actually then surface them to a user interface and, and design the user interface and put the, the code behind that. So the world of coding is much broader than I think we understand. So I'm really, um, you know, passionate about getting people to admit that they know more about technology than they give themselves credit for. None of us are experts. Even the experts aren't experts. They might be experts in one piece or, or the other, but technology is always changing. So marketing, for example, great, great um, 
example of people that are actually coders. I mean, they're they're working in Google Analytics, they're writing UTM tags. I mean, it, it seems really straightforward, but that is still coding. So just broadening your understanding of what is code, it's everything that builds up um, you know, the internet or technology or these kinds of things. And you're all doing it. Remember when MySpace was a thing and people would code their own um, backgrounds and things like that. We all have it in us, but we're none of us are going to be experts. So just giving things a go is the most important thing and not being afraid of technology. All right, you heard it here, people. Do not be afraid of technology. Let's just give it a go. And I mean, it seems like that's your that's your advice for entrepreneurship and for coding. Is just, yes, exactly. Like, let's get into it and let's get it going. I mean, I'll tell you, a really interesting thing about that with Nigeria is people are often willing to give things a go. We've got like a big population of people who are looking for jobs, who are looking for opportunities, as you might be able to see in some of the questions even. Um, so people are willing to give it a go. And I think that next step is actually like building your skills so that you're giving it a go with an actual foundation that gives you a chance at success. And I do have to say that's something that I do emphasize in Nigeria and every time I'm talking is that people read up as much, people learn as much, people like do their homework as much they find, you know, um, they do lots and lots of Googling to learn things, but they also find communities where they can learn and grow within. Um, and I know like for coders, actually, this is a big thing is, mm -hmm. can you find a small circle of slightly more experienced people to, to guide you and show you how to do it? And I think even from an entrepreneurship perspective, you often need that is somebody to tell you what to them seem are like common sense answers about how to go about things, but are really hard won knowledge. If you don't have that experience, you yeah. know, it's, it's necessary to find people to, to, to just help you cut through some of the stuff that might be a little bit more difficult. You know? Yes, it's, I think yeah. what you're saying is uh, don't underestimate the power of networking. So just choose what you're interested in and find a network that can help you grow in that, in that area. Definitely. Yeah, okay, all right. So I've got two related questions here. Uh, one is from Rachie Queen 5 um, How can I work with an uncooperative team? But there's also a related question from someone named Faiza Ibrahim Audu which is how do you motivate a team who is not necessarily aligned with your vision? I know it's super important to have them aligned with your vision, but is it worth trying to motivate them or do you just throw in the towel and start recruiting all over again? So all cooperative team, unaligned team. How do you handle yeah, this? I, I think those are both great questions. I think it, it comes back to almost, I know the, the really cheesy love languages. <laughs> <laughs> but at the, the heart of that or at the foundation is really we need to just find out I mean these are people these are humans what is it about their life what motivates them and I think being a, a coder and being an entrepreneur the, the base foundation of both of those things are you're a great problem solver right and you think laterally um, so if you have a conversation with an uncooperative team member Basically, it, it should have nothing to do with the business, right? You want to say, what are their life goals? Where are they going? What are they trying to do? Why did they even come to work for you? Um, yeah. Find out what motivates them, why they even why they even want to be there. And yeah. if they don't, then better that you ask now and then they, they get lost than you know, having them for another six months or a year. But if you can find that one piece of, that motivates them, then you can use that to say, well, this is how we can take that and use it to grow the company in this way. So coming back to Cypher and saying, you know, everyone on our team has an aligned vision. It's not that we all have the same vision, right? But we know that this business is a catalyst for many different things, for creating a startup that's going to scale, and, you know, and or um, educating a future population or, you know, changing the way that the world works. And so, so fundamental things, or is it, so somebody could join our company and yeah. we could be selling toothbrushes, but yeah. we started selling one toothbrush to five, five people because I like whittled it for, or, you know, like I whittled five toothbrushes out of a piece of wood and I'm like selling it on the street to now selling 3000 toothbrushes every day. Um, you know, with a factory, but they might be motivated just by going from whatever stage we're at now to wherever we want to be. And so taking that motivation could have nothing to do with 
what your business is actually doing, but it's what drives them and what they want to, to do. Or it could be marketing analytics. And so it doesn't matter if they're marketing a kid's coding class or they're, they're marketing, you know, sweatpants. <laughs> yeah, they just really enjoy that. That's, that's where yeah, are they are they interested in the data? Should we get more data tools? Is there anything else you can cut up? Do you want to present the data to the team? Because if they're really motivated by, you know, their outcomes of their little, um, you know, the metrics that they've been hashing, you know, this way and that way and figuring all this stuff out, let them present that to the team that might really motivate them. So I think it just comes back to becoming really personal and trying to understand what drives that human unrelated to anything that has to do with your own company vision um, and then you can kind of pigeonhole them in and show them how you're you have a path for them <laughs> gotcha um okay. i think that's really that's really i think that's really important and i think i've definitely found that where it's like senior members of the team might buy into the vision of the company and really be there you know, to help you accomplish this thing because it's a mission that they care about. And other members of the team are just there because they have the opportunity to do really interesting work for a time and they want to learn and do more of that particularly interesting work. And some people are just grinders and they will do great work wherever it is they are. So you, yeah. you need to find and, and motivate people in whatever way it works. Um, there's a question here. I'm sorry, I'm just kind of skipping through these questions, kind of finding the more interesting ones and trying to put them in an order that makes sense. So there's a question from Olajide Jubril Oguntade. And so he says, most people give generic answers to descriptive questions during interviews, but you soon find out that they aren't exactly what they claim to be most times. So how do you set a structure that makes it for new employees to immerse themselves in the company's culture? And how do you build the culture also? Um, Okay, <laughs> it's kind of two interesting, kind of like two slightly different questions. So yeah, there's sort of the interview questions, like interviews, kind of like yeah, culture. and then there's the company culture. Yeah. yeah. Um. So the interview one uh, is an interesting um, question. Obviously, with Cipher, we we hire a lot of teachers, so we've kind of automated again a lot of the process. So now we can have somebody go from application to being hired within four weeks and be teaching within six weeks. So that's a, a pretty fast machine, right? But when you're hiring within your team, I think you could take some of those same learnings from that, that automated process that I'm thinking about, uh, which are good for interviews. Um, but then again, coming right back to adding in the personal. So when you're interviewing somebody, you have all of the standard interview questions, you kind of have an idea of what you want them to say, they come back and you're like, okay, they've ticked all the boxes. But you could have two people say very similar things. How, how are you gonna make a decision, right? Of which one you're gonna bring on your team. For me, again, I'm, this is why my team says I'm a terrible interviewer. Because that's why I'd rather than just fill out the answers to the questions and I can read that. But then let's have a conversation. Again, it comes back to the, the motivating, the unmotivated team or the un, uncooperative team is get to try to get to know this person in the you know 10 or 15 minutes that you have. So the process for hiring that we do at Cypher is, you know, we get for our internal team, not for our teachers, but we get a you know all of the, the CVs through in a covering letter. And then we'll just schedule 15 minute meetings just to see if you have that personality fit. I mean, we went on a, a call yesterday just to Mia um, and you could tell we just we just gelled right away, right? Like we could have a conversation. You get yeah. on calls sometimes and you're like, okay, this is going nowhere. This is really painful to even just yeah. talk for five minutes. Um, and, you know, I, we have introverts on our team, extroverts. So you can still have a conversation with an introvert. It's, so it's not really, you know, um, it's just seeing if there's that personality fit. I, I know that sounds really oversimplistic, but that 15 minute call just to see, you know, do, have, do they even know what your company is or did they just turn in their CV? Yeah, um, yeah. Why would you want to come work here? Uh, you know, what yeah, do you yeah. like? I mean, that doesn't sound like time? a bad interviewer. No. <laughs> I, it's really interesting because I feel like those are a few of the things that you use an interview for is, are they interested enough in this job that they've done some homework? You know, are they passionate enough about how to do the work that you, about the work for you to be able to tell well, if they join my company, like they, they show an enthusiasm for the work, whatever the role is. It's like you're trying to hire somebody in finance 
you know, yeah. like, do they actually care about this thing? Does it, and you can tell that just from the way someone speaks about Absolutely. their work in an interview, you know? And I yeah. think those are the things you're looking for because the, the hardcore answers and the stuff that people tend to give generic responses to, I mean, first of all, I think you shouldn't ask generic questions and a little bit similar to you, we use a form. And so in terms of like your knowledge of the space and like, do you understand the task? We try to do that in the form, like, you know, so you're answering a question and it's like, well, you want to be an editor. Let's see your thinking as an editor in the form or in an assignment, which might yeah. be there. Yeah. But the interview itself is just, a, you know, did you do some homework in our company? So did you come to this call and you don't know anything about us, which means that clearly you're not somebody who prepares or this is not a job you really want, yeah. uh, you know? And then, you know, can you speak in complete sentences and, you know, <laughs> I, you don't have to be my best friend to work with yes. us. You just have to be like, you know, able to communicate effectively without everybody being in vain, you know? Yeah. Um, so I, yeah, I don't know. It doesn't sound to me like you're a bad interviewer. I think that's that's what you look for in an interview. Um, not, you know, what animal are you? And, <laughs> you <know. laughs> what is your spirit animal? <laughs> yeah, you know. I mean, like, there's some generic questions that are even that are interesting to me. Like, when you ask somebody... You know, where do you see yourself in five years? You know, like if you give me a generic response to that, I feel like you've wasted the interview time because I'm asking you that because I want to know like where does coming to work for us fit in your like life plan? Life plan. Like yeah. so, if in five years you want to run your own business, then I know well you're hoping to take some management skills while you're here, or you want to really develop expertise in it so that you can, you know, be an expert when you go start your own business. But, you know, if your goal is to become CEO of a big company, then I know, well, maybe, you know, this is somebody that's going to go on a management track internally and we will eventually promote them. You know, you, you can have my seat. <laughs> Ready? I am like, I'm, please, I take it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I don't know. I think um, for Jabril, allegedly Jabril who asked that question, if people are giving you generic answers, it might be worth just letting them know why you're asking these questions, you know, mm -hmm. just so that they, and actually that's an interesting thing when you, it's interesting to set the tone in interviews um, and make it clear like, look, this is an interrogation, it's a conversation. And we're just trying to figure out if you're a fit for us or not. And so that only relaxes people enough that they're not spouting generic answers at you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Okay, you've answered a little bit of this, but let's look at Ayolua Badiji's question, which is Ayo's from Lagos, Nigeria. His question is, what frameworks do you employ to assemble your team and motivate your team? I think you've already an answered um, quite a bit of that, but um, yeah, um, I guess, yeah. What, are there frameworks you have for thinking about how you assemble the team? Um, so I think it comes back to those uh, internal teams and the standups. So yeah you can implement that same kind of um, way of, of breaking down a company at any scale, really. Um, but it, it brings it back to being personal. So if you had a team of only five, uh, then you probably only have one team stand up and you know one team daily task. But even if you have a team of 50, having 10 groups of, you know, or even like 12 groups of five or six people that might overlap a little bit, um, really helps to structure the team and also point out where you might have gaps. So thinking about the business plan uh, and what the like, key objectives are for your business will then um, lead into what those teams should be called or made up of. You know, you might have a marketing team, but for me, a marketing team might not be that important right now. It might be online growth, you know, it, it's part, yeah. you know, saying the same sort of thing. But then when you set up a marketing team and you realize that there's only two, two people in that team and this is one of the most important things for my company, that helps you to structure who you need to hire um, and who you need to sort of fill out uh, the gaps in, in, your, in your business plan. So even just giving it a go with that daily standups and um, the team kickoffs on the Monday and, you know, you can um, Google this as well. It's a fairly standard sort of software development way of working, but I think it can be applied, especially in the virtual working world to business as a whole. Um, that's worked really well for Cypher. So that would be my recommendation in terms of structuring your team, but also I think it would help in terms of 
hiring and knowing where to hire um, within the team. Gotcha. Um, okay. The, can I just n let everyone in the audience know, I see a few people kind of putting their questions in the chat. If you could do me a favor and put it in the Q&A, it's more likely we get to it. Um, I've got a question from Ujutule Opalua, which is, how do you handle employee attrition turnover among your team members, particularly your technical team? Yes, um, I think that's a, a two-sided question for, for, for Cypher because we have our teachers who are all yeah. contractors, so 65 teachers, but we go in hiring them knowing where they are on their personal journey and their kind of career lifespan and assuming that they will only be with us for a year, it would be great uh, because we get, you know, oftentimes uh, computer science students or um, teachers that want to just make a bit of extra money. So you might have the career people that, you know, want some extra work, but then you might just have um, somebody that wants to tack this on to another job, a bit of part-time work. But that assumption that you won't have those people forever is actually really helpful, I think, as a, as a, a founder and as, a, as an employer to go in knowing and giving yourself that expectation so that when they do leave, you're not sort of oh, another one left. It's, it's okay. And that's what you've planned for. And that's what you assume on your internal team. I think that's one of the most difficult things as well. Being a founder is that you're very passionate about the, your business, but you also really care about those first hires that you make and you want them to grow and to thrive and to um, progress in their career. So when they do that, sometimes they go grow faster than your company might grow and they have to go and find another job, which is heartbreaking, but, you know, taking that as a, um, a success metric for you, uh, it can be a way to, I think that the hardest part about, you know, staff moving on in that way is the psychological ramification. Like I put so much effort into this person and now they're gone. So it's almost like safeguarding yourself for the inevitable that people will move on in their careers and that's not a bad reflection on you. I think, you know, then you have the sort of bad levers and you deciding that actually this person isn't right for your team. And I think the, the best advice I can give there is that as an early stage founder, again, it comes back to, you know, your first hire, you want it to be professional, but you know, it's very fluid and you don't have all the proper HR protocols in place. But when it comes to letting someone go, that's when you really need to step back and say, okay, let's make sure we're doing this properly so that you don't open yourself up to, you know, um, any litigation or troubles, but saying, okay, we need to first give somebody the opportunity and tell them why they're not performing and then come back and say, you know, we've given you this opportunity, you haven't done it. And so now this is, you know, the next step and just making sure that if you do have um, some people leaving your team, not that they're necessarily bad leavers, but because you've decided that they need to go, that you uh, either take advice or you, you know, look up the proper way to do that because that's where I think you could easily be. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, um, that's a tricky one. That's definitely a really tricky one. Mm -hmm. um, there's a question from Shaban Haruna about what distribution strategy has worked best for your business. And I think you have talked a little bit about this, but. <laughs> yeah. Um, so for the in-person business, um, I would say, which is where we, we teach kids how to code either in after school clubs or in holiday camps, actually within the school. So in person, um, that's essentially a B2B to C model. So we form partnerships with schools and then they pass on the information about our courses to the parents. Uh, the online, you know, model um, distribution or acquisition um, strategy is more through uh, Google ads and, and online advertisements, that kind of thing. Um, but again, the most powerful thing for Cypher and you know, that I think has worked for most businesses is if you focus on the product first, then you can leverage that referral network. And so for Cypher, because we have over 50% of our new students coming recommended by their friends, that again, shows that because we put the effort into making sure that the kids love what they're doing and the product is right and we're giving great feedback to the parents of how the kids are doing, that that growth metric, I mean, it's essentially free, more or less. Sometimes we'll, you know, offer rewards and things for um, both parties, but it's, it's a straightforward way that you can um, see scale very quickly. So that would be my biggest uh, 
recommendation for you know people to focus on as a first stage of growth um, in any sort of acquisition. Um, gotcha. Okay. Um, I have two questions, kind of two-sided here. One is, uh, do you offer mentorship in your classes? If yes, how can one access it? And then another one is, how can people work within your team? So um, you're hiring remote, you're hiring all over the world now. So if someone wants to work for Cypher Coders, how do they do that? And if someone wants to access your classes for mentorship, is that a thing that happens? Yep. Um, so if you'd like to, to work for Cypher, that would be awesome. Uh, but you can just head over to our website, which is uh, cyphercoders.com, and there's a, a hiring section in the footer. I believe the only jobs that we have posted on there at the moment are our teaching jobs, um, but we will be we're, um, closing another investment round soon. So we'll be hiring on our internal team again soon, which will probably most likely be in the customer service side and a bit on the sales side, which again, can be fully remote. So definitely would love to have some of your motivated individuals uh, come and join us. And um, on the, the mentorship piece, um, it, it's a tricky one because it's one of those things that um, I'm assuming that uh, the person that asked this is not between the ages of six and 12. <laughs> <laughs> not really our core audience, you know, the, yeah. the, the preteen audience <laughs> has not quite caught up to tech about yet. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we, we do, you know, have on, on our kind of roadmap teaching older children, but also potentially teaching adults. We don't do that yet, um, unfortunately. However, if you do have, you know, a niece, a nephew, or anyone that's six to 12, you could sit alongside them and they could take the, <laughs> take the course and you could, um, you know, learn through osmosis that way. Uh, but yeah, sign up to our newsletter so that when we do start offering those courses uh, to adults, you can be one of our beta testers, which would be awesome as well. Um, okay, yeah. all right, cool. Oh, not, not the best answer there, but. Hey, yeah, it is. That's all right. Um, there's not a question, but a comment from Angela, which is thanking us for organizing these kind of talks and that they're helpful. Um, I'm going to take that. Thank you, Angelo. Um, and I'm also just going to mention, we're going to trigger a poll now, just sort of like finding out if this was valuable for people. So if you can please answer that, should be the final poll of this conversation. Um, Tosi and Brian has a question about how you developed a suitable curriculum for children and creating a, a structure that works considering you know kids are in school and they have other extracurricular activities so how have you thought about building that yeah, yeah. uh so when developing the the curriculum for cypher it's sort of a, a two-part system right so i understand the fundamentals of computer science and what needs to be taught uh, in order to learn how to code or in order to be proficient in technology but then you have to understand that this has only ever been taught predominantly at a university level, now sometimes in kind of advanced um, secondary schools or, uh, but really computer science was invented in university. So then we look at how does the brain of a six-year-old work? And you know, how does the brain of a six-year-old boy work? How does the brain of a six-year-old girl work? How does the brain of a seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12? And so taking their kind of learning capabilities and what motivates them and their learning styles at specific ages and applying the, the foundations and the fundamentals that we need um, to, to, to ingrain in their, their educational journey uh, for Cypher, uh, we kind of bring those two things together. So the general idea is to have this base foundation of computer science and be able to kind of build up on that. And the best thing about teaching kids how to code, which is you know, in all fairness, way easier than teaching adults is that they're natural, they're naturally little computer scientists anyway. I think the fundamental piece about computer science is that there's no one right answer. So you can yeah. have a problem and you can solve it in so many different ways, which is why it's so rewarding to, you know, some of those kids that think that they're not good in math because, you know, math has a very pers prescriptive way to solve a problem. Computer science, you know, has the same sort of complexity of problem solving, but they can do it in so many different ways. So dyslexic kids, for example, love it. Um, and, you know, creative children as well. So, um, yeah, I guess it's just building up on the fact that children are great problem solvers. They love technology. They're not naturally afraid of it the same way that we, I don't know, we become um, as adults because we see it changing so quickly. So it's just harnessing that energy and, um, capitalizing on that to teach them the fundamentals of 
how to solve problems using technology and um, computer science and transitioning between all the different languages. I saw a question about um, starting at age five using Scratch, and that's absolutely exactly where we start. Um, for online, we do say six because it's a bit about, you know, operating the screen and Zoom and then another screen. And I mean, it's just <laughs> the complexity of that is, is one thing. But Scratch is an amazing um, language because it's what I spoke about at the very beginning. It's sort of like little virtual Lego blocks that can be stacked together. So it already has the code uh, within it. So children don't have to be able to type. But just by reading the code that's within a Scratch, um, you know, program, it's in the same format that they would see in real code. So it's, a, it's an amazing um, you know, first language to, to get them um, into, into computer science and into coding. Okay, fantastic. Um, and I apologize everyone, I don't know if we're gonna get through all of the questions because we are coming to the end of this. Um, I guess, let me just ask one more, which is Olufumi Koya. Once know, how do you convince employers that are a good fit for a post requiring a training you haven't completed yet? For instance, she's currently acquiring data science and project management skills and is applying for remote jobs and internships. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. That's a great question. But I mean, as a hire, I think that somebody should hire you because they see that you're motivated to teach yourself these skills. And so in the interview, getting across your passion and your motivation to upskill and to, to better yourself should come across as um, a way for them to see that even once you've acquired those skills and you're utilizing them in the job, if there's another skills gap that you might have, you're the type of person that will go out and upskill to make sure that you're always you know, ready for that position that you're applying for. So I think if you can get that across in your interview, that that's the kind of person that you are, that you're a go-getter and that you're willing to put the hard work in, in order to have the skills, in order to do the job, then, yeah, that, that's where yeah. it's being gold. Yeah, no, um, I think that's a good answer. You probably also shouldn't apply for senior roles in something that you are still learning. <laughs> yeah, maybe so you have to match enthusiasm role, but... with <laughs> being able to like deliver something. Um, I, uh, there's some really good questions that we, have not um, gotten into, and I apologize, people, but we do try to keep to time on these things. Um, we're going to post the video up for this. Um, actually, let me ask a question, Elizabeth. If people want to reach out to you, what's the best way to do it? Twitter, LinkedIn, yeah. What, what's, yeah. Yeah, please connect with me on LinkedIn or uh, just send an email to hi at Cypher Coders, and I'm happy to answer any of the questions that we didn't get to today as well. Excellent, fantastic. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate your taking the time to join us and we hope that it's been valuable. Um, you should please join us on the next uh, Building from Ground Up uh, webinar, which will be on March 11th. And it will be another really interesting uh, sort of conversation around um, uh, building you know, for entrepreneurs and for founders and solving the real problems of actually building a business. There is a survey. I believe the link's just been dropped in the chat. So please uh, do fill it out for us. Uh, Timmy has dropped it. Timmy, if you can drop it again, so everybody sees it. Um, please fill it, let's know what was useful in this, what wasn't, what you'd like to see better. Uh, today's session um, and the whole Building from Ground Up series was brought to you by the UK Nigeria Tech Hub, um, which is committed to building Nigeria's digital economy. Um, it's an initiative by the UK Government's Department for Digital, Culture, Media, and Sports, that's a lot of words, DCMS, to support <laughs> the growth of Nigeria's tech ecosystem. Um, and so the UK Nigeria Tech Hub works to stimulate global digital economies, support sustainable growth and jobs, and build high-end digital skills, forge innovation partnerships between Nigerian tech sectors and international businesses. So um, leading to more trade and investment in the long term, um, and sort of sessions like this a part of like the broader digital access program, which are, you know, looking to catalyze digital inclusion across Africa. So thank you to the UK Nigeria Tech Hub uh, for helping us put this to, together or for, you know, for organizing this session, which Tech Hub all facilitated. Um, their social channels are on screen. Please go follow them on all of these social channels. And um, Thank you again, this event, um, the next session, okay, yeah. So next session, um, now we can go back, uh, yeah. is going to be with Chichi Equozo. 
who is the founder and CEO of Ascenti. So check us out on March 11th. And Daniel Adeyemi, one of our senior writers, is going to host it. Nice. Um, this, um, for, from the Tech About team, the TC Insights team actually really does the heavy lifting on these events. Um, thank you to Tifa and to Lanray and to everybody else who has helped work on it. TC Insights is our data and research arm and our intelligence arm. Uh, they provide actionable mm -hmm. data on startups and the tech ecosystem across Africa. We work with big tech companies, we work with startups, we work with foundations and states just on digital transformation. You can contact us at tcinsights at bigcabal.com or if you go to the Tech Cabal website, it's techcabal.com slash tcinsights. Great. Um, and you should definitely subscribe for TC's newsletter, which is an amazing newsletter around um, everything that's happening in technology in Africa. Um, it comes out every morning, 7 a.m. West African time. The link is on there. It is fantastic, especially for those people who are trying to get their heads around what is happening in the industry in Africa. You should definitely subscribe for that. Super, super valuable. Elizabeth, I want to say thank you so, so much for taking the time. Thank uh, you so to join much us for having me. Really engaging session. I loved it. Um, I thought it was really, really valuable. So thank you. And um, everybody go check out Cypher Coders, you know, um, especially those of you with kids. Yeah. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.